Okay, and then we'll go to screen share. Um, how did I do this? Brother Smith, Sister Angela was trying to get in. Are you able to let her in or do you see her? No, uh, yeah, they just she just now popped up. Okay. So let me see. Well, I still have, haven't. She's still not showing to, to one end. Okay, maybe. She's not, she's not asked to be let in yet. Wait a minute, um, right here. Here she comes. Okay. There she is. Okay. She's joining now. There she is. Um, as I was saying, uh, there's I've had a lot of requests for this. And uh it, it is a big, it's a big subject. There's a lot of scriptures on it. And um, even though I, I feel certain that all of you that are on tonight know and understand what we teach on the subject of hell, but you may not, it may not, it may have been years since you've heard the teaching on it that goes through the scriptures. Um, and so I don't think I can finish this tonight, and uh, so we may have to move it, you know, to to the next. Um, Y'all can help me watch, but I think it, it comes up on my screen when someone asks to come in, so I don't think there'll be a problem with me being able to come in. What is going on here? Oh, okay, so here. Can y'all see my full screen now? Okay. Um, so we'll just start here tonight. Uh, I'll just welcome everybody that's on here. It is recorded. Also, if you have the Olive Tree Bible app, all of my all of my scriptures that I have here on the right side of my screen, uh, I can copy them. And I can send them to anybody and you can put it, you can, you can make a note on hell and put it right in your olive tree app. It'll have everything that you're going to see tonight. So I'll be glad to do that for you, or I'd be glad to just copy it and paste it and send it to you in a messenger text or WhatsApp or you know, on message or email it to you, however you want it. But I can, I mean, even if I copy it and send it to you, on a message, you can copy it and paste it into Olive Tree. You can make a note for hell and in, in, in a category, one of your categories. For example, right here, do y'all see this part on my screen where my little cursor is? Somebody answer me. Y'all see that cursor at the bottom of the screen and I'm going around and around with? You yes. may not. You do? Yes. Okay, thanks, Sister Angela. Okay, that's just, you click on that for notes if you're on Olive Tree. This is for a resource guide, which is, you know, your commentaries, your Bibles, your, your um, cross-reference or whatever. Up here at the top where I've got hell, that's my subject. If I click this to the left, click it more than once, here's all the different subjects that I have notes on in my Bible. So all you'd have to do is hit the plus sign and create a category, title it hell, like I have done here. It says I have one note. Well, when I click on it, then here's all of my, here's my notes that I've got under that one category subject. So it's very simple to put in if you're using the Olive Tree Bible app. I personally think it's the best Bible app I've been able to find in many, many years. Of course, I've quit looking, so there may be something out that people like that I don't know anything about. Anyway, we'll get started here uh, on this teaching I've got here at the top, Understanding Hell in the Bible. Sheol, hell, sheol is, inter is, is translated hell, grave, and the pit, and pit in the Old Testament. Hades is in the New Testament, Gehenna and Tartarus, seven hells. The Bible has seven different uh, seven different titles or wordings that apply to hell in the Bible. So 
again, if you want this, if you want this teaching that's laid out here, be glad to copy and paste it and send it to you. Um, so first, I want to just give you some some scriptures here that pertain to uh, that I think we, needs to be considered before we look into the Greek words that is interpreted hell in the Bible. And most of you have heard of these. Uh, Genesis 2, God talking to Adam, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. So uh, in the day thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. He was never told anything other than he was going to die. He wasn't told about an eternal, bar, you know, um, burning or eternal torment or anything like that. He was just simply told that he was going to die if he ate of the tree of knowledge of good, good and evil. Genesis 3, dust thou art and dust thou shall return. That's what he tells him. Uh, you know, he's made of dust. You're going to go back to dust. If uh, I have a teaching on, and I've got notes in my Bible here on when God was talking to the serpent, on serpent, the belly, and dust. God told the serpent, he said, you're going to, you're going to, crawl on your belly all the days of your life, and you're going to eat dust. And I've got a teaching all through the Bible on the serpent, the belly, and dust. The belly is always dealing with the flesh. It, it has to deal with your innermost being. Like Jesus said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. But, but there's many scriptures on belly that are referring to uh, the innermost being of the corruptible nature of that or the Adamic nature. And then dust, of course, re is referring to the flesh. Anyway, I, if you if you study that all the way through the Bible, it's pretty interesting because it it it's all symbolic, just like it was in the garden. Here in Ecclesiastes 3:20, dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. All go to one place. All are of dusk, all turn to dust again. Uh, Ecclesiastes 9.10, there's no knowledge in the grave. It goes a little further than that. I didn't write it all out there. It says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there's no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor, uh, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. So in the grave, there's there's not any there's no knowledge there there's no wisdom there, um, and we'll we'll look into more scriptures that get into greater detail than this. But uh, of course, this is interpreted from the word sheol. The word the Hebrew word sheol is the only word in the Old Testament that's translated hell. Uh, it is also translated grave, and it's translated the pit. I'll show you that in a few minutes in further scriptures. John 3, 16 is a simple, very simple verse we all know. You know, uh, he that believeth in him uh, should not perish, but have everlasting life. People read over that. I, I came out of Babylon. I never even heard anybody refer to that scripture saying, look at that word perish. What does that mean? You know, you should not perish. Not that you're not going to, but you shouldn't. If you believe in the Lord, you shouldn't perish. But if you don't believe in him and you don't live a righteous life, you are going to perish. Uh, then Romans 6, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is, is eternal life. See, in religion, they teach that everyone gets eternal life. It's just eternal life with torment. But the Bible teaches us that that carnal, I mean, that mortality must put on immortality. You don't get immortality <laughs> unless you are a you've overcome the Adamic nature. There's no putting on immortality. 
you're mortal, and that word means that you're subject to death. And uh, one more verse here I want to give before we start in with these with the Old Testament words. It's Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, Jesus said, but are able to kill the, the soul. Uh, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him, which would be God, which is able to destroy both body, soul and body in hell. So you can destroy it. God will destroy the soul in hell. That word, that word right there is actually in, interpreted. Uh, I, I, I start off here next with that. The Greek word here is interpreted here interpreted hell is Gehenna. It's a Hebrew of a Hebrew origin. It means the valley of Hinnom, Gehenna, or Gehenna. This was originally the valley of Hinnom, south of Jerusalem, where the filth and dead animals of the city were cast out and burned, a fit symbol of the wicked and their future destruction. See, uh, Hinnom, which is interpreted, Gehenna is interpreted hell in the New Testament, and it's referring to the Valley of Hinnom, and that was actually their trash dump, and they burned it to, to destroy bacteria and disease that could be in their refuge, and so it's smoldering all the time. That's why you know, it looks like it's an everlasting fire. It, that's what, that's what, uh, how did uh, Matthew say it in Matthew 13 concerning John the Baptist? He said, I indeed baptize you with, with water under repentance, but there cometh one after me. He shall baptize you with, uh, with the Holy Ghost and fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he'll thoroughly purge his floor and the chaff uh, the wheat he'll gather into his garner, garner, but the chaff he'll burn with unquenchable fire. In other words, that fire is unquenchable. If if you're, you know, God is not going to save chaff. I've said a lot of times that um, uh, chaff, of course, chaff and tares are two different things. Tares are not wheat. They look like wheat, but they're not wheat. Chaff is what Chaff is the all of the stock of wheat that produces the grain. So that's who you are. You're chaff. But out of you, uh, that is, if you're born of God, you, you've got a nature that's it's like chaff, and it will produce seed. But when God's finished producing the seed, he'll burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. He'll destroy the chaff. God's not going to save the Adamic nature, the human, the human nature. God, uh, the, that Adamic nature, God is going to destroy once he's produced that Holy Ghost or God-like nature, and, and you actually become uh, immortal. And so God doesn't need the mortality anymore. But... Uh, but tares and chaff are two different things. Tares, Jesus said, leave them alone until the harvest. So or you'll, or you'll destroy some of the wheat if you if you don't. We, you know, you got you get people, there's people in the body of Christ that are tares. But there's people, there's more people in Babylon that are tares that are really not God's children. They're they're not, they don't have the nature, they're not wheat. Uh, but they get involved in a religion, but they're not, they're not God's children. Those are tares, and God will separate them in the end, and he'll, he will, he will uh, destroy and burn the tares and bundles. But, but um, he's also, he, he also will, you know, there will be this Gehenna here, and let's go back to um, Matthew 10, 28. I put out here, notice here in 10, Matthew 10, 28, not only the body is destroyed in Gehenna, but the soul is destroyed too, just as the trash and dead animals were destroyed in the Jerusalem 
of valley by fire. The key here, the key word is destroyed. When you destroy something, it's done away with. It's done completely away with. Just like fire does completely away with whatever it consumes. There's nothing left but ashes. Okay, Sheol in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Translated grave, hell, and the pit. In the authorized version, it's translated as grave, hell, and pit 65 times in the Old Testament, grave 31 times, hell 31 times, and pit three times. So there, there's 65 in, uh, interpret, uh, translations of Sheol into grave, hell, and the pit grave and hell 31 times each. And you're gonna find here that <laughs> the way the translators dealt with this is they, um, I, they translated grave to the righteous people of God mostly and hell to the wicked people is who they translated it for. You'll see that in several of these scriptures here. It's translated pit three times, and we'll go over them. Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter, verse 10. Again, there's no knowledge in the grave. Translators interpreted shield to hell when dealing with the wicked, I said, and grave or pit when dealing with God's people. In Genesis 37, 35, it says, I will go down to the grave, shield under my unto my son mourning. Not one, not one, no one would think Jacob. This is talking about Jacob when he was concerned about Benjamin, you know, that he was, re, it was reported to him that, that uh, I mean, Joseph, that he was dead, got killed by an animal. And, and so he's saying, I'm going to go to the grave to my son mourning. No one would think Jacob went to hell up to a hell of torment. Here's a godly man, uh, you know, uh, the the son of Abraham, and uh, Sheol is also interpreted grave, not hell, concerning Jacob. And I just put these scriptures in Genesis 42, 38, Genesis 44, 29, 44, 31. He's also dealing with Jacob going to his grave, talking about his hoary head going to the grave in sorrow. So um, here, Sheol is an interpreted hell. It's interpreted grave because it's talking about a righteous man. Okay, in Deuteronomy 32, this gets uh, a little more interested as interesting as time goes on. Here in Deuteronomy 32, uh, God is telling Moses, concerning Israel. He's foretelling Israel. Uh, he's really telling them about, he's foretelling AD 70 here. But he says, for a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell, that hair there, her shield, and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of mountains. I will heap mischief upon them. I'll spend my arrows upon them. They'll be burned with hunger. I want you to notice here, the lowest hell there is, is being burned with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beast upon them when the poison of serpents of, uh, and uh, with the poison of serpents of the dust. Uh, this is talking about AD 70, lowest hell burned with hunger and bitter heat, foretelling to the future destruction of the nation of Israel in AD 70. Jeremiah 19, 7 through 9 also refers to the same thing. Um, and we know from history that, you know, when the Roman, when the Romans invaded and burned uh, the temple just begin to destroy Jerusalem and the people began to flee to the mountains and they surrounded them there. They had no water. They had no food. That's why Jesus told them, pray that your 
flight be not in winter. Be, woe unto them that give suck in those days. He was prophesying to them of God's judgment in AD 70. Come on up. Those people, when their babies died, they cooked them and ate them to stay alive. They ate one another. Uh, that when they died, they drank their own urine. They ate their own feces. They did what they could do to stay alive, but it didn't, it, you know, they, they still were destroyed. Uh, it was a terrible, terrible judgment that came on them for rejecting Jesus Christ, their Savior. Uh, and God finally, you know, when God finally finished his harvest, that world was, uh, that, that the harvest was over and there wasn't anyone else to be saved and God judged the Jews and turned to the Gentiles. It, here in 1 Samuel 2 and verse 6, Hannah prayed uh, and declared, the Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and he bringeth up. Sheol wasn't translated hell here, but grave. Who would believe that the Lord would bring man up out of hell if it's eternal punishment? Moses expressed the same, only in, in slightly different language. In Psalms 93, I'll click on it here for you. Thou turnest man to, to destruction and sayest, return ye children of men. They show there would be a resurrection. Thou turnest man to destruction. Oh, I did re, re, uh, print it out here. The reason I did this is I can click on these and show you what they say, but I printed them off so that I can hand them out in a Bible study in printed form. Everybody will have them that way. And so it's, uh, you know, you didn't, I didn't necessarily have to do it this way, but for me to print it off, to, to copy it and paste it onto like a Word document, I needed those scriptures to be printed off for those who wouldn't be able to put it in a Bible app. So that's why I did it this way. So return you children of men. Jesus died to redeem the soul, life of man from death and restore him to life from Sheol, the grave. First Kings, I'm dealing with Sheol here in the Old Testament, the, all these scriptures. And, and there's more scriptures. I just use the ones that are very plain and and I think that, you know, drives uh, the thought home. Uh, it, it didn't need to be any, any more in depth than what I gave here, I don't think. First Kings 2, 6, go, go down to the grave in peace. Uh, I didn't print that out. Do therefore according to thy wisdom and let not his whore head go down to the grave in peace. This is David talking to Solomon. I think about, um, what was the guy that cursed David's name? Um, oh. It's Joab, Joab. What was his name? It's Joab. No, not Joab. Well, it may have been Joab oh. he was talking to. Oh, it's Shimei. It's Shimei. Shimei the guy. was the one I was thinking of, Brother Byer. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, but here, he listen to what he's saying here. This, this is the word translated into hell. Not let him go down here. His hoary head go down to the grave in peace. Well, you couldn't put hell there. You're not going to go to hell in peace. Not if it's what religion teaches it is. So they used grave when it fit better, and they used hell when it fit better for how they taught it. If they would have followed the scriptures, it'd have been hard. And by the way, you can research it. The Jews in the Old Testament never believed in a, in a hell, a tormenting, burning hell. That wasn't part of the belief of the Jews' teachings. You, you just won't find it in, in, in the Jewish Bible that where they used Sheol. Uh, here in Job, the 14th, chapter, verse 13 through 15. Here's what Job says. Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that thou wouldest keep me secret until thy wrath be passed, that thou wouldest appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait 
till my change come. Thou shalt call, and I will answer thee. Thou will have a desire to the work of thine hands. Here, Job prays to go to hell to escape wrath, and later expresses faith to come up from the grave, shield the grave in a resurrection. So they certainly couldn't put Job in hell. Not, not righteous Job, but here he's talking about being hidden in the grave. Uh, he would stay there until he got a resurrection. Psalms 89, 48. What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? Sheol, which is also translated hell in many places. In other words, can one escape death and the grave? Can you escape hell if they wanted to translate it there? We're talking about the same word. Proverbs 2, 10 through 22. This, this is a little bit lengthy. I did not print it all out, but a person could go to it. I could show it here. But uh, and now it's talking about, let me just go to it here in, in in, in my on my scripture, it says, Wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. Discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, deliver thee from the way of the, of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who lead the paths of the upright of uprightness, to walk in the way of darkness, who rejoice to do no evil, to do evil, and delight in forwardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked, and they, they forward in their paths to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. That thou mayest walk in the way of good men, and keep the paths of the righteous. For the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect shall remain in it but the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. So here he's, he's just showing what's going to happen, that there's going to be some that are going to be destroyed, removed out of it. Well, if uh, like I have here the, uh, in verse in Proverbs 5, 5, it says her feet go down to the depths, to death. Her steps take hold of hell. That's Sheol. That is translated grave in some places here. It's translated death. Proverbs 7, 27. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Uh, Proverbs 9, 18. But he knoweth not that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of hell. Here, Proverbs chapters 2, chapter 5, chapter 7, and 9 typifies more than a natural harlot or strange woman, but a false religious system. This is shown to be true when you look at Revelation 17, uh, 3 through 7. It says, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman set up on a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed with purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harless, harlots, an abomination of the earth. So these scriptures that are dealing with that her ways and steps go down to hell 
is dealing with something deeper than just a, a, a natural woman, but it's dealing with there's the Bible. It's better to understand the Bible that is talking to two women, the true church and the false church. False, the true church is the body of Christ, the kingdom of heaven, and the false church is a harlot system of man. And so um, here Jesus said, if we look at Matthew 23, 27, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are likened to whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and are all of all uncleanness. So he, he, he calls them in another place, whited sepulchers, uh, you know, grave, gravestones. They're, they're, they're graves. They're, they're, they're in the you know, dust thou art, dust shalt thou return. Proverbs 21, 16, the man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. So you can be in a, a congregation can be dead and not have life in it while it's here on the earth. You know, death's overshadowing everyone. Uh, you're only, you only can come alive in a new birth. So um, Israel's covenant with death in Isaiah 28, 15 here says, because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell, we are we at agreement. Their covenant with death and agreement with hell, uh, verse 15 through 18, it, it's, it's dealing with AD 70. Their agreement with death God showed that they're just, they would be destroyed. That nation would be destroyed if they stayed in that great agreement uh, and a covenant with death. Uh, okay, Isaiah 38, 10. I shall go to the gates of the grave. Th these are words of the goodly king Hezekiah. That was a statement he made here in, in Isaiah 38, 10. I said in the cutting off of my days, I shall go to the gates of the grave. I'm deprived of the residue of my years. This is when the prophet told him that he was going to die. And everyone of you know the story that he sought God, repented, and petitioned the Lord, and God added 15 years to his life, and he didn't go to the grave. But, you know, who would believe it if it said, I go to the gates of hell? <laughs> you know, he, he was a goodly king. Uh, Isaiah was one of, the, one, of, one of the most righteous kings that Judah had. Um, then in Jonah, here, Jonah 2.2, 2, it said he cried out of, the, out of the belly of well, and he called it hell. Here's what he said. I cried by the reason of my afflictions unto the Lord, and he heard me, and out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Jonah was in the belly of a fish. He called that hell. It, it was a grave. That's what Sheol was to the Jews that he was, he thought, I'm going to die right here. This is my grave. This is where I'm going to be buried and consumed in the belly of this fish. Of course, we know the story. The fish went to shore and coughed him up <laughs> or threw him up, however, that what happened. But I'm just showing you scriptures that deal with how the interpreters dealt with Sheol, some places with hell, other places with the grave. Bible truth on this subject is found in Ezekiel 18.4, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. So there's your main scriptures on Sheol in the Old Testament that, you know, when you look at how the interpreters interpreted these words of the righteous people of God going to the grave, like Job, like Jacob, like Hezekiah, but wicked 
the wicked are going to go to hell. It, it sheds a whole different light on it when you handle it two different ways like that. Now let's look in the New Testament. Let me see. Um, who knows? I might be. I don't know if I can finish this or not, but if not, we'll carry it on to another Zoom meeting. In Acts 2.27, because thou wilt not leave my hope, my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. This is a, a quote. It's the words of, of, Ma, of Peter on the day of Pentecost, speaking about Jesus, that he won't leave his soul in hell, neither will he suffer thine holy one to see corruption. By the way, Hades is translated hell in the New Testament. It means the same thing as Sheol, the grave. Uh, here on uh, Peter on the day of Pentecost used the Greek word Hades or hell in quoting Psalm 1610, which used the word, the Hebrew word Sheol for hell. Therefore, we see Hades in the New Testament has the same meaning as Sheol in the Old Testament. This verse shows how Jesus went into the grave or Hades or in Psalm Sheol and was resurrected unto life. His soul wasn't left there. Of course, you know, you can't stop on that one scripture by yourself to explain that because in, in Babylon, they teach that Jesus died and didn't stay in the grave three days and nights, but he went to hell and had a revival down there <laughs> and, and got people out of hell. That's how they teach it out there, that he was in hell, but God got him out of there, but he sent him there to help those people that was in hell. And uh, I guess that's where the Catholics get purgatory. They're teaching on that. Jesus said in Revelations 1.18, I am he that liveth and was dead. That's exactly what that means, dead. He was dead in the grave three days and nights. He had to taste death for everyone. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Um, Matthew 16.18. Jesus said, and I say unto thee, thou art Peter, talking to Peter about Peter, whom do men say I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ. And he's, he's telling him, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell, the way to death and the grave. Now, this statement in response to Peter stating that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God, uh, here in Matthew 16, two verses before is where he, he said, thou art the Christ. The great truth is the church will be built upon Christ, the rock. I know he changed Peter's name from Simon to Peter, which means rock. Uh, Petra, which, which means rock. But the truth is here, he's going to build, he's going to build it upon rock, on Christ, the rock. Paul said in Ephesians 2.20, and we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. That's what the church is built on, on that cornerstone. Also, Peter said in Acts 4.11, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. We see here also that hell has gates, many times referring to ministers. In Psalms 24.7, it says, lift up ye head, lift up your heads, O ye gates, be ye lifted up, you everlasting doors, that these gates are preachers in the Bible. So since he's saying um, the gates of hell wouldn't prevail against the church, when he said, you're Peter, and on this rock, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell. Those gates of hell, we have found out in the body of Christ, refers to ministers. Ministers are gates. They can open the kingdom of heaven or they can shut it. They're a door. 
They're a door to an assembly. Uh, they're a door to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Jesus, he was the door. Uh, and uh, But we're, we are in Jesus' stead also a door, also gates. Uh, let's look here. Um, Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate. That's, that's, a, that's a preacher that is a straight gate. He's, he's honest. He's upright. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. You know, that's one of the things that Brother Nick asked men that were elders and assemblies of God that he was in that organization when he found the body. He met with some of those men that was trying to get him to stay with them in the Assembly of God movement or organization. And he said, well, I'm going to ask y'all some questions. He got some answers. You know, he said, tell me, who, who are these gates? What is the mansion? And uh, what was the other one? Maybe somebody can remember what it was. I'm trying to think. There was a third one. He had three questions. He answered them. He said, they didn't answer none of them. And he said, three strikes, you're out. <laughs> Let's see. What's the mansions? The ditch. What, are the ditch. what is the ditch? Was his next question. And, and, and of course, we know the ditch is, that's a harlot system. We know it's the same as a pit. We know that, uh, you know, we understand that, that Gates was talking about preachers. I didn't know that either when I came to the body of Christ. You brothers had to teach it to me. Um, so, uh, you will, okay, here he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he's made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. That hell there is Gehenna. It's not Hades. That right there is not Hades, but that's Gehenna. Um, you're making them twofold more the child of Gehenna, which is the Valley of Hinnom, where the fire is devouring. That's where, you know, you're in, you're in uh, a system of man. You're where there's judgment that's going to be continual, and it's going to devour you. They were in hell in the world when they had come to sea and land. They were already in a hellish condition in the world, being devoured in a hellish burning condition like like a fire now they're in a second now they're twofold the child of hell now they're in a religious system and also in burning and in judgment so they're in a false system uh revelation 6 8 here and i looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him Death is the rider, and hell follows death. It said hell followed after him. Here, this is symbolic showing that death and hell are practically synonymous in a corrupt, destructive religious system promoting its ideology through the earth. So this, this hell here uh, is not a hell if you look here, I'll go to it right there. That hell is Hades. That, that is actually the grave uh, that it's showing here in, in the Greek word hell, but that follows with it. In other words, if you're in death, if death is the writer and they can't produce life because they don't have any anointing of life in their message, 
then all hope you've got is the gray, if the gray, Hades. And so uh, then in Revelations 20, 13, death and hell delivers up the dead that are in them. And it's strange that people that get the thought that those who go to, to this Bible hell or religious hell that they teach will never escape. But here's a here it's clear that hell delivers up the dead that's in it. Revelations 20, 14 says death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. Now they already got hell as being a lake of fire, but here's where it's cast into a lake of fire, which is second death, it says. So um, where does it say that? Right here, 2014. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is second death. Well, Jude describes being twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Well, you're dead in sin when you're here on the earth until you're born again. Death is overshadowing you. You're doomed for death. That's first death. That's one that. That's the first death you've entered into just coming into the world. Death has got its, its hold on you. We're, we're cursed unto death when we're coming to this world. Unless God redeems us through Christ, we don't have any hope. But then if God deals with us, are we never accept Christ. And we are if we accept Christ, and, but we never are faithful and we're unjust in God's dealing with us, then if you're twice dead, plucked up by the roots, you know, you take a tree, like Job said, if, if a tree falls, shall it live again? Well, yes, it can, because you can cut a tree down, and from the roots of that tree, there, it's got roots to it, and there's still sap and life in those roots that it's getting from the earth. And so here a little sapling will come up next spring and produce another tree right out of that sapling. But if it's plucked up by the roots, you cut a tree down and then you dig it. You dig all the way down and get its roots and remove them. It's destroyed. It's never going to come up again. And so um, there's no hope when you're twice dead. This, when, when the lake of fire, which is, this is second death. In other words, the final eternal judgment is the lake of fire. That's God, when God eternally judges something, then, and it, it's, it's an unquenchable. Here is Gehenna, an unquenchable fire. Let's see. I didn't read, though, first. Let me go back up here to Luke 16, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Being a parable, it's, sim it's symbolically referring to the Jews being the rich man and Lazarus being the Gentiles. In AD 70, the Jews went into a death state, Hades, being cut off from God as a nation, and Lazarus went into Abraham's covenant, which is called Abraham's bosom. That's all symbolic, but the rich man, the Jew, you know, he said, send Lazarus just to touch my tongue with a drop of water. Again, this is symbolic. He, the Jew has been in a Gehenna state. They've been in a burning state of God's judgment ever since they were cut off by, by their forefathers re, rejecting Christ. God left the Jews, he judged that world, and then he went to the Gentiles. And they're still in that state today until God grafts them back in. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, he said, well, send him. He said, if I, if I sent you somebody, if, no, he said, send him to my five brothers. Well, he was talking about Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia. I mean, uh, let's see, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then him that was under Rome. That, that's talking about 
all of the dragon powers that Israel was under before God harvested the Jewish world and cut them off. And he said, though I send one that has been raised from the dead, they won't hear it. And of course, he was talking about himself. And so the hell there is a symbolic hell that, that Jesus was talking to him about that, that the rich man went into. And he sees Lazarus. He sees the Lord. It's all, it's all uh, a parable, but it's a beautiful picture of what God was trying to get him to see. Okay, Gehenna here. Uh, hell's referring to the Valley of Hinnom. I've said before, south of Jerusalem, where their the refuge was burned continually, fire smoldering and destroyed their refuge. Matthew 10, 28, we've mentioned it before, not to fear him that's able to destroy the soul that's not able, but to destroy the soul and body, but fear him that's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Again, the key word here is destroy. These are not words that would think that you would think there would be any life after destruction. Um, and if any reasonable person looked at all of these scriptures and how this is laid out, it would destroy their belief in, in an eternal burning hell. I've had men tell me, if I didn't believe in hell, I wouldn't even serve God. And I've said, well, that's the difference. You have to serve God because you love righteousness, not because you're trying to escape hell. Jesus said, he that, how did he say it? He said, he that, uh, let me get that scripture. Uh, he that seeketh to save his life shall surely lose it, but he that loses it for my sake shall surely find it. So if you're serving God to keep from going to hell, you got a whole wrong motive uh, totally about righteousness and, and God's purpose and plan for man. It, it separates the boys from the, from the men from boys or women from girls. It, you know, to, to want to serve God because you love righteousness and you hate iniquity or evil, that's, that's what, that should be our motive and reason for wanting to serve God, not to escape some tor place of torment. The Bible just don't teach that. Um, however, this teaching does help you, you know, if you lose a, a loved one or a family member, of course, you have to leave everybody in God's hands. We're not their judge. God knows their heart. We don't know, you know, like who would have thought that the thief on the cross, if somebody hadn't heard that and wrote it down in the Bible, you would have figured that both them thieves had no hope. But we got it in scripture where one of those thieves, Jesus told him, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. Of course, he was talking about the day of the Lord not that 24 hour day, but the day of the Lord that he would, he would come up in a resurrection in Matthew 27, 52. But we don't know what's in a man, in any man's heart or what they are, how God would deal with. So we can't judge God's servants altogether. We may be able to judge in this way and say, I know that person didn't make the bride. <laughs> they didn't have the, if they were, you know, if they died a sinner, even if they, on their deathbed, confess the Lord and had true repentance. I think they've got hope of a resurrection, uh, either of the just or the unjust, but I'm smart enough to know they didn't make perfection in that one repentant statement, especially if they didn't have the Holy Ghost. So, um, okay. Jesus said here in Matthew 5, 22, Whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell, Gehenna, fire, destruction. In other words, if you say to your brother, thou fool, without a, without a cause, without a just cause, you're in danger uh, of, of being judged yourself by slandering your brother. 
and then also here in Matthew 5, 29, he states, if your right hand offends you, pluck it out. Uh, here he's dealing with, uh, he's using it as allegories. Uh, to, it's better for you to, to, how did he say, it's more profitable for thee that one of thy members perish and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. That hell there is Gehenna. A destruction, a destructive uh, type of judgment that's like fire, destroys like fire. He said that in, in all of these things he's saying here in Matthew 18, if your foot offends you, cut, cut them off. Matthew 23, he calls them servants and gen, generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell or the judgment or condemnation of hell if your hand offends you? He's talking about judgment AD 70 here. That was, the, that was the judgment that they would be cut off in if they rejected Christ and maintained the false religion that they were being persuaded of against the body of Christ then. Let's take a look at Matthew 9, 43 and 44 here. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed than to have two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. See, and that just means it's, it's just like a, it's like out in the south part of Jerusalem here. It's smoldering all the time. You're never going to stop that, that fire from burning up everything. It'll devour everything all the way. It ain't going to be quenched. You ain't going to get the fire put out. You turn away from God. Now here it says, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Well, the worms that would not die were the Gentile nations that would continually oppress and persecute the Jews until their judgment of AD 70. These are the worms of Joel 1 and 4. The Palmer worm was Babylon. See, the, what the Palmer worm didn't destroy, the locusts would destroy, Babylon. What, what Babylon didn't destroy, the canker worm, Media Persia, would destroy. What, what the canker worm didn't destroy, Greece, the caterpillar, would destroy. Uh, or the, I, mean, I mean the canker worm, and that the caterpillar is Rome. It would, it would destroy. And they were judged, they were finally judged in the Roman during the Roman Empire. So that that worm that dieth not is talking about those worms that Joel prophesied about that would that was destroying worms of Israel. Luke 21, 24, it said, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. He's referring to AD 70. The Jews would be cut off until the end of the Gentile world. So uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just explaining a little more of the scriptures, more than just what it's saying about hell. But I'm covering some of these other things like a worm that dieth not the fire that's not quenched. Giving a little bit further instruction from that. By the way, I am going to finish this. Look at uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. And to you who are troubled, rest with this. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Notice that everlasting destruction. It's, 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 it lasts forever. It's destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, eternal judgment in the day of the Lord, what he's talking about. He was talking about, he was prophesying concerning down here in the end of the Jewish world, but it also took place in the same way in the end of the, I mean, in the end of the Gentile world. Here's what Paul's talking about in 2 Thessalonians, but it took place in the end of the Jewish world back there too. 
And then finally, uh, Tataru. It's only one time in the Bible, in the New Testament, and it's in 2 Peter, verse 2, 4 through 9. Verse 9 says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. The unjust are reserved unto the day of judgment, either in the end of the Jewish world or in the end of the Gentile world and during the millennial and or the final resurrection. Go back here where he says, um, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, these were the messengers, that word angel means, means messengers. I right hear messenger uh, could also mean a bishop or pastor. Um, but if he spared not the angels, um, let me go back to it here that sin, but cast them down to hell. That hell is to Taru. In other words, they were reserved because there wasn't a judgment. There wasn't a judgment seat of Christ set up yet before the harvest in the day of the Lord in the end of the Jewish world. Neither will there be. We don't have that yet until the judgment seat of Christ is set up in a restored church down here. So, uh, there, those those messengers that sinned and were cast down to hell are unto and were reserved unto judgment in the grave. Delivered them to chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. In other words, uh, chains of darkness. That's just like one generation after another generation in ignorance or darkness that God can't reveal to them. Uh, they will not hear the words of righteousness of God, the truth of God's word. They said he spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example, an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly and deliver unjust lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man, notice here, the Bible calls Lot a righteous man, dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day, with their unlawful deeds. Then he says, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment. This is the, this, when, when you go back and look at the, the word to Tara here, well, if you go back to right here, this word to Tara, uh, it says to incarcerate in eternal, eternal torment. That's how they in, interpret it. But it, what it is, it got, their, their God is reserved them under judgment. They haven't lived at a time when they could have judgment applied to them. And they'd have an, uh, they'd have an opportunity to get out of Tatar or to get out of uh, the reserved judgment that they're due to to be judged. God's going to judge a man or, or, or you know, a woman both for all the deeds in their life. If they're God's child, they're going to have an opportunity for life. And that's the only people that's going to come up in a resurrection. That's the only people that's been reserved unto judgment. But that Tataru is a, it is those that are reserved unto judgment that God will hear it. The unjust are reserved under the day of judgment, either in the end of the Jewish world, where God harvested that world. And, and that's not talking about anybody resurrecting that, that are in Tataru. It's talking about those people that, uh, that died 
they die, they're going to be unjust. They won't come up until the final resurrection. And the same thing down here. There's people that's died in the Gentile world. They're unjust, they're dead, and they're reserved unto judgment. They're in Tataru. But those that are in the grave that could resurrect in the resurrection of the just, those people are, uh, they could come up in a restored church like Matthew 27, 52. And uh, those people would be just, not, not people reserved unto judgment. But those people uh, are worthy. They're worthy people, just like those in Matthew 27, 52 that, that Hebrews 11 deals with. Here, I read again the verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and reserve the unjust. These are who are in Tataru under the day of judgment to be punished. It will take punishment. It'll take chastisement of correction for God to get an unjust person the unjustness out of their spirit. So anyway, I just, you know, I hope this has been helpful. It, it took a while to put it together. Uh, but I know that my, I know myself, it's been many years before I went over in any depth our teaching on hell. And I, I have covered here Sheol, hell, the grave, the pit, Hades, Gehenna, and Tatara, which are the seven uh, words that, that hell is derived from in the Bible. And so I hope that's, uh, I hope that that's been beneficial to you. And uh, anyone that wants these notes, I'll be glad to copy them and send them to you. All you have to do is just ask me for them. Uh, you can text me on my phone. I'll send it back to you in a text or on Messenger or on WhatsApp, or if you want me to email it, just text my phone, tell me how you want it, and I'll send them to you. All I got to do is just highlight all of it like this and just hit, just hit copy, and then it's, 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 it's on my computer. For me, I can do it on my phone the same way because I have every one of these notes in my Olive Tree Bible. Uh, the, one of the things I like about Olive Tree is I've got this computer in my office at home. I've got it in my office in my kennel. I have it on my phone. Uh, I have a new phone, uh, the Fold 3, the Samsung Fold 3, and I do like it. But anyway, I have Olive Tree Bible on it. I can, and, and anything that I put it in, in my notes or on my Bible, on my phone, or on my computer up here, or computer down in the kennel office, on my wife's phone, on my iPad, it 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 automatically syncs every note and everything I do anywhere every night. It will sync those notes, and I can manually hit sync too. Like in other words, during the day, if I'm in my computer doing something, before I close my computer, I can hit sync and it'll sync it to all my platforms. And so I can pick up my phone, it'll be right there. So, so uh, you can send me a text on my phone. I can copy it right on my phone and send it to you um, or however you want me to do it. Let's see here, my notes. Yeah. See there, there's all my notes. You may not be able to see them. Those are the exact same notes. It's on my Bible tree right here on my phone. So I can copy them, send them to you if you want them. I'm also printing them off for those of you that are here in, um, in um, Little Rock. I'll print them off on paper and give them to you Sunday morning. I can print them off and give them to you there. We do have a wedding. Sister Claire's marrying Brother Matthew Wallace, isn't it? From um, Belton Assembly, Brother Brad Ratliff's church. We have a wedding at, uh, I believe it's at four o'clock 
Saturday. Is that correct? Is that the time that's correct? I hope it is because I'm I'm supposed to be doing the marrying. I hope I don't show up late after it's over. But anyway, let me let me go back to uh, stop sharing here. Get y'all back on my screen. What time is it in? Two o'clock. Oh, it's two o'clock. I would have been late for the wedding, huh? Okay, sorry about that, Sister Claire, if you're on here listening, but we I'm sure they would have gotten me there on time. Anyway, um, God bless your hearts. I, I don't know, that may be a little bit dry tonight, but at least we covered it. Uh, I don't know how, you know, I don't know how you can cover all that unless you just keep going, you know. And I, I'm glad I was able to do it in one setting. It is recorded. So anyone wants it on the recording that wants to hear it again, I can send you that recording on Zoom and you can you can just open it if you've got Zoom. I mean, once I send you that recording link, you touch it and you can just watch the whole service that we had tonight again. Look at it that way if you'd like. So just ask me for this, the, the uh, Zoom meeting on hell. I'm going to title it hell. <laughs> I told my wife that I'm the only hell that my mama raised. I shouldn't have put that on tape. Should I? Should I, I should not take that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, maybe if everybody let's 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 all pray before we leave tonight. Um, I want you to keep praying for Brother Goss, for Brother Bill Daniels, uh, for little sister Mallory. Um, Sister Durham's mother, sister, her name is um, Sister um, Hayes, Sister, let me see, what's her first name? Leslie. Leslie Hayes, yes. So remember that. Uh, brother, um, keep praying for me. I'm, I'm really, I'm having a lot of trouble with my neck from my, you know, from when I broke my neck. I'm having a lot of pain in my neck just, and it's just, I'm sure it's probably arthritis, but I am asking God to help me a little bit and, and vertigo. I'm, I'm hoping God some way will help me find a doctor that can help me get over this vertigo. I just, I can function with it, but, but, you know, I can't run. I can't turn real fast. It's real easy for me to fall down, you know, if I, because I just can't, I just don't have any stability. If, I, if I'm doing anything that, you know, the other day I was actually fishing with brother Mark Boyd in a, in a, our boat. And uh, it was a little bit windy and a wave hit the boat. Wasn't a big deal, but as soon as that wave hit that boat, I fell just right. Of, it almost fell in the water, it almost fell out of the boat. But Brother Mark got, he helped me up twice. I fell from just a wave hitting the boat because it was a little bit windy. I, I, two times, I just, I mean, if I, if something like that happens, there's no way I can catch myself. I just, it's impossible. I'm just too unstable with vertigo. So I appreciate it if y'all keep me in your prayers concerning that. Um, I've got a, doctor's appointment too on the 15th next week that there's a possibility that there would be I might need surgery uh it's prostate surgery I don't have cancer or anything I'm clear of all that but I still do have uh, a large prostate that I you know that they can do a procedure on me it's like it's it's elective but I've got enough symptoms that the it would be welcome if they can help me but I've got that appointment next week. I wish you'd pray for our brother Lewis's grandson that's got cancer, this young man in, in uh, Virginia. Remember him in your prayers. What else? Somebody else got a re request? Yes. Sister Debbie. My... Sorry, go ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, Sister McNabb. Sister Debbie Hughes, brother Tim Hughes' wife is um, out of intensive care. And they've taken her off the ventilator. Oh, that's amazing because I didn't like, really have much hope. I know. So Hughes, sounds... Yes, thank you for reminding me. Brother Hughes, both of them had COVID bad. 
but he he began to improve fairly quickly. Um, but Sister Hughes was has several health issues, and she wound up on the bench. And I hadn't heard yet. Thank you, Sister McNabb, that she's out of intensive care and off the vent. That that's marvelous. That's wonderful news. So keep them keep them in your prayers because we we were worried that we were going to lose Sister Hughes. So I'm thankful to hear that tonight. Okay, Sister Brother Brother Durham, did you have a prayer request? My sister has lung cancer. Okay, yes. Thanks for reminding me about that. Your sister, uh, in, is that in Springfield or in California? Springfield. In Springfield. Is that your twin sister? No, that's my older sister. Your older sister, okay. So she has cancer she's been diagnosed with. So remember Brother Durham's sister. Who else wants has got a request. All right. All right, let's all, if everyone would, um, unmute your phone and let's, um, let's all pray together before we go home tonight. It's to me that it's always a blessing to pray together. Thank you. Oh, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God. So many Oh, God. 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 Oh, Thank Oh, Love your mercy and grace, Lord. Thank you. Thank Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Ask anyone questions tonight, but just write it down. We'll try to get next time if you have a question that we didn't get to. God bless your hearts. I'll see you guys over here locally. Enjoy Sunday and Saturday at the wedding. I'm sure most all of you will be there. Praise God. Uh, to see Sister Claire get married. God bless your hearts. Praise God. Thank you. God bless. Good night. God bless you. Good night. Good night. God bless. Amen. Good night. Good night.